Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Prayer. I want to change gears a little bit and ask a question and possibly answer a question that I don't ever hear anyone ask. What is the goal of the Christian life? What is our goal in becoming a Christian? Now, like this article states, you, know, you ask, you get a knee-jerk reaction from most people, but it comes from a place, and I agree with what this guy says, as Daniel Wallace says, I agree that that, that that answer, that instant answer most people give, is not based in knowledge or understanding. I believe that that knowledge and understanding of what the actual goal of becoming a Christian is, comes through sanctification. It takes time. Because all of us start out with very selfish reasons. I don't want to go to hell. It's a selfish reason. It's focused on us. But God doesn't look at that reason. He's like, you believe? Awesome. I got you in the door. Now I'm going to teach you something. Now I'm going to show you. Now I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to show you the real reason why you are called. I'm going to show you the real reason real reason why you are saved. I'm going to show you the real reason, what all real reason this is what this is all for, and what it's going to lead to. What is the one thing? that has dominated the scripture and dominated our society from beginning to end. Hatred, war, strife, ridicule, mocking, scoffing. If you put on a scale the word love and put on the other side of the scale the word hate, and then you take that scale, you balance that scale based on society for the last 2,000 years, the side with hate on it hits the floor. And cracks it. The side with love has no weight. The greatest emotion and the greater response to almost everything is with hatred. Now, our view of hatred is skewed because we go by what the world considers hatred. It's the my truth mentality. People say, well, these things are okay for me. Now, if you do it, it's not okay, but it's okay for me to do it. They have a double standard. The Bible warns against these things. But when we come under the blanket with the understanding of what the Bible says hatred is, what God says hatred is, we get a far, far more descriptive understanding, and it's the better understanding. And that understanding convicts every one of us. So what is the goal of the Christian life? What is your goal in becoming a Christian? What are you looking forward to? Did you become a Christian to get raptured? Did you become a Christian to get rich? Believe it or not, that's a response from people. In their mind, they believe, I'm going to have a better life. Things are going to get better. I'm running to God and becoming a Christian and taking on this title because I want people to stop making fun of me. Well, big surprise. The Bible says that if you become a Christian, they're going to make fun of you more. They're going to pick on you more. You're going to be hurt and attacked more. Because you're taking a path most people don't want, don't want to take. When you take the Word of God into account on this question, you really have to ask yourself some hard questions. You have to respond with even harder answers concerning your own walk and your own desires and what your own drive is. What is your drive in this? Is it to glorify God and is it to love others? Is it to be there for other people or is it to serve yourself? I answer the question of uh, last year, I think, maybe the year before, what is the meaning of life? I've, I've pondered this ever since uh, I was preteen, 12, 11. I've pondered this question, what is the meaning of life? The meaning of life, and I've told people, I figured it out, the meaning of life is to love others. The meaning of life is to help others, is to be there for others, is to be a blessing to the people around you, is to help others get through this life in any way you can. And what you're going to read in this article, what you're going to hear in this article, is a very similar statement. And it is based very, very, very heavily in Scripture. Daniel B. Wallace, Becoming Christlike, The Goal of the Christian Life. When asked what is the goal of the Christian life, a typical mantra heard in evangelical circles is the knee-jerk response to become Christlike. Some folks really think through what they are saying, and their views are more nuanced than the slogan. But most Christians, I fear, just parrot what they have been taught. 
This post examines the model with a view toward articulating what the goal of the Christian life should be. When I was a young man, I desperately wanted to be Christ-like. I was told that this was the primary objective of the Christian life. How many of you have heard that? I have. I've heard that over and over again. The more I worked at it, however, the more I began to see my failings. It's a works-based belief system. Every time I needed to ask forgiveness from someone, I considered myself a failure at the time at the, as the prime objective, or at the prime objective. Every time someone corrected me or pointed out some blind spot in my life, I realized that I was treading backwards. It started to unnerve me. As the years rolled on, these constant failings became too much. Slowly, imperceptibly at first, I recoiled at the notion that I was still a depraved sinner. After all, I had been a believer for many years. Shouldn't I be reaching perfection by now? Does this strike anyone as familiar at all? See, when you read through the scriptures, you start to realize very, very quickly, reaching perfection here in this world, in this life, in this body is not the goal. Perfection is waiting for us and is being presented by God to us. We are going to be changed into perfection by him. We are merely being sanctified to that point. This is what everything he's just said is a works-based salvation. Some form of work is involved in you becoming this. I got people constantly talking to other people, doing videos still, saying that I'm adding works to salvation. I love that you guys, that my name is in your mouth. I love that you're talking about me because you're bringing people to my channel to get the truth. Thank you. Keep doing it. But see, if we don't self-examine, if we don't really ask ourselves the hard questions, why am I a Christian? If we don't have that talk with Jesus... Like you're talking to a friend or a confidant. Like you're talking to a psychologist. Why am I a believer in you, Lord? I want to know the truth about this. I want to know because if I'm not what I'm supposed to be, if I'm not what you want me to be, if I'm not what I think I am, what good am I to you? I want to be an actual believer. I want to know that I'm there. That's humility. That's agreeing with him. That's coming to terms with your sin nature. And coming into humility. And Lord, I, I can't do this. I need you desperately. But what, what do most people tell you? Do this and you'll be saved. You've got to stop smoking. You've got to stop smoking. You've got to stop smoking. Really? You know how many people smoked back then? A lot. That was a very prominent thing. Did a lot of other things, too. Some of the greatest men in the Bible were involved in those things. Did that hinder their salvation? Nope. But what people have done is they've created this understanding that there's works you have to do, and these are those works because that's what I believe. When they don't go to the Word and prove it in the Word. Nowhere in the Bible is smoking mentioned. Nowhere. It is non-smokers that are telling you that. I've had people that were vegan come onto my channel and email me. You want to be perfect like the Lord, you you got to be a vegan. Really? Because Jesus ate fish and he ate lamb. So he wasn't a vegan. I've had vegetarians do the same thing. You know what I tell them? Do you eat gelatin? Oh yeah, I love gelatin. You need to go look up how gelatin is made. And then they find out real quick that they're not vegan or vegetarian because gelatin is made from boiling beef bones and hides. Yeah, big newsflash. People always think that their way is the best way, and they want to instill that and inflict that on other people. It is only non-smokers that tell smokers, non-smoking Christians that tell smokers they have to quit smoking. You go to the Lord with that. You don't go to someone else. The Lord will show you. And if he wants you to stop doing something, he'll make it happen. This is part of us humbling ourselves. It works the same with sin. It works the same with overeating. It works the same with everything. We go to the Lord with that. But is that what he's focused on? You have to ask yourself, is, is that what the Lord is focused on? Okay, this, these fat ones right here, I need to get them skinny. Is that what he's focused on? No. Absolutely not. He's focused on where your spirit is. Where is your understanding? Where is your love? Let's keep reading. Of course, I rejected the Keswick model of sanctification. The idea that one could be in fellowship one minute and out the next, in the next, and so on. That's losing your salvation. That wasn't my problem. 
I also had rejected the Wesleyan perfectionism model, at least, theoretically. I knew that I, was, that I really was never going to be perfect in this life, even in the limited sense. But I nevertheless assumed that I should as be as much mature, be much more mature, sorry my eyes are a little blurry, than I really was. So in order to save, or in order to salve my conscience, soothe his conscience, about reaching the goal of Christ's likeness, I began to hide my sin. I put blinders on when I was confronted about my behavior. Anyone who's on the other side or anyone who's opposed to anything I teach here, you need to listen very carefully to what I'm about to state. Because many of you, this is where you are. I put on, I began to hide my sin. I put on blinders when I was confronted about my behavior and wormed my way out of asking for forgiveness, justifying my lack of need for such on the basis of my supposed maturity. And I, if I sat down and wrote a list, it would be a list from two years worth of doing this, of all the people I've run into. In fact, I could just go to my block list and write all them down, of all the people that this is what they think. And they don't realize it, but that it's evident in, their, in the way they talk. They think they're perfect. And they want everybody else to be perfect according to what they think. They don't want to do, don't want to do it according to what the Bible thinks. Yet the Bible proves quite clearly that even the apostles hand-picked men of God. The starters of the church were men with sin natures. And they knew they had sin. And even after being saved and after being filled with the Holy Spirit, they still had sin and they openly admitted it. See, far too many people today have gotten caught up in this understanding that they can be perfect based on what they believe. Or they can be perfect based on advice from other people. And not ever actually reading the word themselves. Because when they do... They'll see what they're doing, which is what I just read, this one sentence. I would rationalize my sin and see fault in the one who pointed it out. Ah, that guy's not very godly, so why should I listen to him? You're not showing Christian love by telling them they're wrong, even though they're wrong. How many times have I heard similar statements? A thousand? Maybe more? How many times have you heard that statement? You're not being very loving. That's a great excuse to deflect from the point that we're talking about here. And I've had to tell people, don't deflect from the point of the conversation. Because you don't want to address this. Let's stay focused on what we're talking about and not deflect. And I've had times where I, it's, it was a wrestling match to get people to stay on subject. Because they started to see that they were there were wrong and they didn't want to admit it. This guy is, is describing a large majority of the Christian population. At one point, when I was in college, I made a table of the characteristics of love mentioned in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 13. At the end of every day, I would rate myself on how I was doing. I'd use the 100-point scale. The irony is that the very passage that others intended to help me focus on others became a means for me to focus on myself. Christ-likeness meets legalism. But the more I studied scripture, the more I came to realize that I had gotten the focus of the Christian life totally out of whack. If my goal is for me to become Christ-like, then my goal is inevitably and necessarily self-centered. How well am I doing at this goal? What do I look like as a Christian? My goal has become my role, and the focus has become too inward. When all you do is focus on you, and your sin nature, and your godliness, and your righteousness, which is what I hear almost all Christians talk about. Even the, this, the most wonderful, peaceful, graceful, grace-filled person, that's what I hear them talking about, is them, and what they're doing. And how godly they're becoming. Their goal has become them. When what are we supposed to be doing? Edifying our brethren, lifting them up in prayer, coming into intercession, praying for each other, loving each other, caring, advising each other, helping each other, calling each other out when we step out of line from what the scripture says. Hey, hold on a second. Come back here. This is what the Bible says. I'm telling you because I love you. I don't want to see you struggle. This is, and look, I'm guilty of it too. We all do this. 
because it is a pride thing. But when you learn to start getting that pride knocked down, your view of everything changes. Your goal now becomes others. I want to help them do this. I want to help them do that. You want to be Christ-like? That's how you become Christ-like. I want to help them do this. I want to help them do that. You pretty much dedicate most of your time to being a benefit as much as you can to other people. There is time for introspection in the Christian life. It should, however, be a time of repentance toward the Lord and gratitude for his love and mercy. But there is also the need for robust concentration on the Lord and on others. Paul tells the Philippians, instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. That's in Philippians 2.3. I highly recommend you go read the book of Ecclesiastes. Matter of fact, I have a playlist where I did every chapter in Ecclesiastes. And look at what he's talking about. And now you see what he's talking about. Because all the things he called vanity in there were all the things that man did for himself. It's all vanity. He, Solomon came to a very, very interesting conclusion. What do we do for God? And what do we do for ourselves? And how much of our time does each one of those take up? When you start to realize that, you start to realize, I need to dedicate more time to him. Look, uh, remember, remember, I'm guilty of this too. We're all guilty of it. This is a great reason why we do what we do and why I cover what I cover, because what helps me, I know is going to help you. That's why I go through these things. So Philippians 2, 3, let's go take a look at that real quick. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let me highlight that. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You know what that means? That means you give up the best seat so someone else can have it. You count them more worthy than you. That means you take the lesser and they take the more. It's, it's a way of humbling yourself. When we would do our potlucks, I would serve the people in line. Hey, can I serve you? You want some of this? And I'd serve them. Most of the time, I wait till everybody else eats before I eat. That's just something that was ingrained in me. That's something that, that I want to do because I care about people. I would always put people as much as, well, not always, but as much as I could, put them before I, me. And I did it somewhat naturally for a large portion of my life. Then I became very selfish. And it was because of the situation that I was in and different things that were going on. And I went down that path. The Lord has brought me back. But I'm still there. I'm still selfish. I have not achieved perfection. I cannot achieve perfection. It is him that's going to make me that way. So this verse very, very clearly explains this concept. And look at verse 4. It goes even further. Let each of you look not only, look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let's highlight that one too. That's good. So you have to look out for yourself at some point, which we do. But make sure that in the time that you're doing that, and you know what I like to do, and this is just me personally, is when I'm doing something, I like to do it and, and find a way to make it about someone else. That I'm doing this, but it's going to be a blessing or a help to someone else. I have, um, right now I'm fixing my uh, utility trailer. Had a bad tire on it. And I'm putting some new lights on there. And I needed to do it anyway, but... I'm doing it because I'm about to go this weekend, and there may not be any videos. I'll tell you more about this later in the week. There may not be any videos for a couple of days, but I'm going to uh, drive up to Missouri to go get my mother-in-law's stuff that she has in storage up there and bring it back. It's going to take about three days. I needed to fix the trailer anyway, but I, I'm, I found a way to do, make it for someone else because otherwise we'd have to pay a ton of money to rent a U-Haul. Well, I have a perfectly good trailer. That's, that's the kind of stuff he's talking about. I have to fix it anyway, but now it's going to be where it's going to be of use and a blessing to someone else. And that's what I try to do when I do things is start to find a way to make it a blessing to someone else if I can. We can't do it perfectly, but we do what we can. But that's what he's talking about. That's what these verses are referring to. We're right here. Right there. I used to argue with this verse, yes, but if all of us did this, then no one would be more important than anyone else. Missing Paul's point is putting things charitably. 
The Lord was the first to rub Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18 together, calling them the greatest commandment, and one like it. Love God and love your neighbor, Matthew 22, 34-40. The focus in these passages is not on one's role, and therefore not on one's self-image, needs, or ego. The focus is on the glory of God and the needs of others. Now you get a, a taste, a hint, of what the real Christian life is supposed to be about. There it was in black and white, and I missed it all these years. If the goal of the Christian life is primarily to glorify God, then the focus is certainly not on myself. It's the combination of attitude and actions that work together to magnify the Lord. Kind of sounds like James 2, doesn't it? And the second goal of the Christian life is to focus on the needs of others. Love your neighbors as yourself does not mean to love your neighbor as you should love yourself. No, self-love is assumed, not commanded. Loving one's neighbor is not. Interesting. One of the implications of this new revelation, to me, uh, to many people, <laughs> about the goal of the Christian life was that by focusing on what I should become, I was missing the proper outward and upward view of life. I'm going to read that again. Listen closely. One of the implications of this new revelation about the goal of the Christian life was that by focusing on what I should become, you should be sinless, you should be not smoking, you should be not eating, should be not drinking, should be not doing all these things, and here's all the things you should be doing. The list is forever growing, and that's what you hear people talk about. You should do this, you should do that. What do you hear me talk about? You should read the Bible and pray to God. What does that do? It's, it solves and fulfills all of this by doing those two, two things and plant seeds. It, it completely encompasses all of the law. Just by doing those three things. It's amazing. So the goal, if you're, if, that if you're focused on what I should become, I was missing the proper outward and upward view of life. And it became harder and harder for me to admit my wrong to others. Be why? Because pride. He became super selfish. How many people won't admit they made a mistake and misinterpreted a verse? How many people won't admit that the understanding they have about a per particular concept in the Bible, when clearly proven wrong by Scripture, will send there and go, you know what? That's absolutely right. You got that right. I was wrong. I'm completely wrong. I'm so sorry I attacked you on that. I was absolutely wrong. I didn't see it right. What do you hear instead? You're a heretic and you're adding works to salvation. You don't preach the gospel. You're not a real Christian. You're going to hell. That's what I heard. That's what people said to me, supposed Christians, supposed grace believers. That's what they said to me. Called me stupid. Said I was an idiot. Told me they loved me one day, stabbed me in the back the next day. That's what I heard. Instead of admitting they were wrong. When we showed everybody, when they were talking about, oh, well, how many people was it that was talking about if you say that uh, uh, belief is in the heart, you're adding works to salvation, it's not in the Bible. How many people did we show the verses to? The multiple verses that say that specifically, that it is in the heart. Did they admit they made a mistake? No. Pride. Very huge, huge amount of pride. And consequently, the consequences for their actions just got them more subscribers. That's the way this world works. While the rest of us lost subscribers. That's the way the world works. But this is exactly what he's referring to here. I was missing the proper outward and upward view of life. The way you get to heaven is through the blessing and the advancement of others. Because that is love. It is through glorifying God in your life and in your daily activity and in what you do for those other people. And then the consequences of his belief... It became harder and harder to him for him to admit his wrong. But the believer who seeks God's glory, but the believer who seeks God, God's glory and thinks hard about the welfare of their fellow saints is not arrogant, does not hold grudges, is not self-absorbed. All of us, for as long as we live in this world, will need to ask forgiveness from someone. The mature person recognizes his own sins and readily admits them to others whom he has offended. The one who focuses on his own Christ-likeness is focusing on a tent, a, a, ter, a tertiary, ter, ter, tertiary goal and can end up being blinded by his own ambition. 
how many people fall in this category. For many, this blog is a simple lesson, one that you've come to recognize for a long, long time. For others, it may be startling, unsettling, but the self-absorption of American Christianity has a lot to learn. I'm glad he said American Christianity, because that is exactly what American Christianity is. I pray that each of us can make the main thing the main thing. Shed ourselves of our insecurity as begin each day by asking, how can I magnify you today, Lord? Or, and, you can ask, how can I magnify you to someone else today? Give me the right words. And that is what I try to focus on through the different messages I share in these prayer videos is what the goal is. The goal is to glorify God in, in everything we can and to be as much of a blessing to others as we possibly can. Now listen, sometimes they make it impossible for you to do anything for them and to be a blessing. I've come to a very stark realization here recently that my whole life, my, my family has seen me as somebody to be used and they have done a very good job of doing that. But you know what? I was a blessing to them in every way I could possibly be. I don't regret a second of it. I don't regret one wrench that I've turned on cars for family members and anyone else. I don't regret one house, piece of furniture that I've moved. I don't regret one, one vehicle I've, I've given cars away. I don't regret money that I've given. I don't regret anything that I've done for my loved ones and my friends. I don't regret any of it. I'm, I was happy to do it. And I'm still happy to do it in whatever capacity I can kind of limited now because of the disease, but nevertheless. I don't regret any of that. Because I love them and I want them to be blessed. I want to be a blessing. I want to help people. But the Bible says when they use you spitefully for my in my name, or because of my name, or because you're called by my name, you doing good to them heaps coals of fire on their head. Even though that's the truth, and even though the Bible says it, I, I don't like that. I used to, I used to derive a little bit of joy from knowing that I'm going to be nice anyway, and that's going to put coals of fire on their head. But I, I kind of gotten to where I would rather them get saved. I would much rather they get saved. But that's not my call. The goal of the Christian life is to love others more. Then we love ourselves. We have to love ourselves. Every one of you, I actually did a video on this. Every one of us loves ourselves. We love ourselves. We buy ourselves things. We buy ourselves clothes. I just bought some stuff for my trailer. Um, I buy myself tools. I just bought a, a battery powered impact and I got a tool kit coming. If it ever gets here, it's a really, really nice thousand piece tool set because most of my tools are broken or tore up. We have to buy stuff for ourselves, but when we use those things to serve others or when we go out of our way to be a blessing by using our talents, using our finances, using our things, using whatever we have to be a blessing to others, we glorify God in that act. And then we glorify God in our living as a Christian. That's the goal of the Christian life. Now, most people, like I said at the beginning, when they get saved... It's all about escaping hell. It's all about, oh yeah, I want to go in the rapture. I want to go to heaven. But as we grow in sanctification, as we come to a greater understanding, as we move from spiritual milk to spiritual meat, we come to a much broader understanding of what salvation really is and what the goal of all this is. And the goal is so elaborate, but yet it's the simplest thing possible. How amazing is it that the gospel is such an elaborate design yet it is such a simple concept how is it that that what what our calling is on our life is so elaborate and descriptive and full of detail yet it is such a simple thing to merely love someone more than you love yourself and at least love them as much as you love yourself now to some people that me loving them is me doing everything for them to make their life easier while they don't have to do anything. Is me kowtowing to them and giving them whatever they want whenever they're doing it out of selfish ambition. To some people, that's love. For me, love is when I'm hurting or I'm in a bad position and I call on someone and they drop what they're doing and come 
and assist me. That's love. That's love of knowing you're more important than me and what I have to do. There are times in my life when friends would call me and I was the last one they called and I dropped everything. I'm on my way. I've turned around and gone back after when I was going somewhere. I've stopped whatever I was doing. I'm on, I'll be right there. And that doesn't make me better than anyone else. But that's the mentality that he's looking for, is that you put others before yourself. In the army, they taught us that concept too. Others, you have training. You are an elite fighting force. The average American is not. They don't have training. So when you see a situation go down, you get between that situation and them. That's your training. That's what I'm trained to do. Even in my weakened state that I'm at now. I see something go down and a gun is pulled or a knife is pulled. I'm there. That's my training. But what was amazing about that is, is I already had that mentality before I went in the army. It's just reinforced it and solidified it. This is the Christian walk. This is the, the goal of being a Christian, is to grow in that idea, to grow in that concept. Because when we all are a blessing to each other and when we all are glorifying God, I want you to think about this and then we're going to pray. What if every person had an epiphany and they thought, you know what? Why don't we all just come together, give up our, everything we want and our ambitions, come together and kneel as a planet, kneel and tell God thank you for the many blessings he pours out on us every day. And then we go find who has the greatest need when we're done. We find who has the greatest need around us and we all converge and help them with what they need, it, whatever it is. And we work our way through all of our people around us and help all of them with what they need. We're not going to go to work. We're not going to go to the store. We're not going to do nothing until everyone has benefited. Do you know if that happened tomorrow, there would be no tribulation? Hear me out. The tribulation is for a specific purpose. You go back in the Old Testament, you can see where God's wrath was turned away several times. Where God's mind was changed several times. By people who stood up and considered others greater than them. By people who glorified God over themselves and their ambitions. If the whole world stopped and we all prayed at one time, giving thanks and glory to God, and then spent the next month helping our fellow man with whatever they needed. The old couple down the street needs their garage cleaned out and a new roof put on. Done. The old lady that has hardly any food in there. I got your groceries, ma'am. Grab a couple people and go and get them, bring them back and fill her house with food. All those thing, little things like that that we take for granted and we stop and help others. God wouldn't, there would be no need for the tribulation. God would stop. He would stay his hand. He would stay his wrath. And everything would change. Don't believe me? Do a little Google search. Places where people suddenly came to God and what happened in those places. The massive changes that happened when, multi, when tons of people got saved at once and God blessed them openly. It's all through history. You can start in the Bible because there's a bunch of stories about it in there. The first one that pops into my mind is the walls of Jericho. You know, they found Jericho. They excavated it. They found damage to the walls. They said, it looks like it's just like what the Bible said. All they did was march around it for seven days, blowing trumpets, and the walls fell down. That's God. A group of people came together in truth. Came together as Christians, as believers. They weren't Christians back then. As believers. 
glorified God, helped each other. And everything changed. And we have story after story after story in the Bible about that. Plus in our history, a bunch of men came together with a common goal and Judeo-Christian values to bring up a nation that would be the greatest nation this world has ever seen. And within weeks, America was born. Look how much things change when we come together as brethren. That's the goal of the Christian life. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this evening in your name to honor you, to honor you in our life, to honor you in our daily activities, to honor you with our words, with our prayers, and to honor you with our actions as we go about this world and we find people that need help and we stop what we're doing, take what our agenda is and put it to the side and see what they need and help them with their needs. We glorify you in those things and we glorify and edify and lift up our brethren in the process. Why can't we all come together like that? Why can't half of us come together like that? Just half of us. What could we change? I will never forget when I saw that video, and it's been taken down since then as far as I know, that video where 10,000 Christians got together and went to Times Square and shut it down. Blocked all roads, no traffic to go through, and for 20 minutes sang hymns and prayed. And it was right before Trump got elected president. They prayed for him to be elected president. 10,000 people, and you changed, you took a situation that absolutely 100% was geared to go, a system that had been in place for generations, and you turned it on its ear and put a different person in place that was not at all supposed to win. You turned the tide. You changed what was supposed to happen because we came together. And it was the most beautiful thing to see and hear. I wish the video was still up. It's amazing. But if 10,000 Christians could do that, what could 7 billion do? What could 1 billion do? Let's be conservative. <laughs> what could 1 billion do? We can't come together close enough to do that, Lord. Lord, uh, we glorify you. I'm sorry. We give you glory. We give you praise and honor. And we love you and we thank you so much for this word, for people who share these understandings, that, that their own realizations of your truth contained within your word. And then they can go to scripture and prove it, but that it shows what your true desire is for our lives. We can find your will for our life merely by reading your scriptures, merely by listening and talking to people who have figured it out. And it wasn't by anything they did. It was because they moved themselves out of the way just long enough to be able to see clearly to what you were teaching them. And when we learn to do that, what a day, because it changes everything. The very future of an entire people was changed multiple times in the past merely by those who believed in you, and not a very big number of them, coming together in truth, coming together and following the goal of their lives that you had for them. And it changed everything. Sorry. Yeah. What, what could we do? What could we accomplish if we could learn to do this? What an amazing concept to think about. And we know that that's what it was meant to be. And for a while, it was like that. But Satan has just got too much of this world in his hip pocket. And too many people are so caught up in pride. Lord, I don't want to be prideful. I don't want to be stuck on myself. I want to be a benefit to others. I want to bless others. And I want to do it not only to glorify you, but to be a blessing and to help them. It's hard nowadays. Because of what's going on. Satan has found a way to stop us. But you know what? I still find ways. Little ways here and there. We all can. 
Wuhan, when they got went on lockdown, we saw the greatest, amaz most amazing act of love Christians could give. The very people they were killing and putting in jail just a week prior to the lockdown were going door to door giving out masks and Bibles and, and food and water. That's Christian love. That's putting others above yourself. That's putting others' welfare above your own. That's exactly what this article is talking about, and that's exactly what your word is talking about. To think of others more significant than ourselves. Your scripture says it. In Philippians 2, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not Look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What an amazing concept. And what, what could be changed if we could learn to do that just a little bit? I have hope. One of the great things that you've given me is hope. I have hope that people can change. I have hope that Something at some point could change. Well, what a day that would be. <laughs> I have hope. Now, in reality, I know because of prophecy, it's, pro it's not going to happen. But I have hope that people can change. And that's born out of love for my fellow man. Lord, any situation that comes up that you want me to be involved in, make it known to me and I will be involved in, in a heartbeat. Any situation that arises where I can be a benefit and a blessing to others, make me to do that. Because I belong to you. I am your servant. I'm here to do your will, not my own. Make Change my mind. And as it comes to my brethren, make me to be their servant. I am not above them, but below them. Because this goal, what I'm doing here, is holding up the believers. And the only way that I can at the moment. And there are many of us out here doing the same thing. You built your church on a rock. It's not the foundation that's crumbling. It's that last upper portion that's starting to give way. Because there just aren't enough of us here. Lord, I pray many people change their mind. Turn to you and glorify you. And bless their brethren with love. And that love becomes the dominating emotion. I pray for all my brethren for that peace and love to just be so powerful to just overwhelm them. And that desire for your word to just overwhelm them that they can't stand it anymore. I would love to see people change. I would love to see the world change. Because I know the consequences of good things like that happening. They're very good consequences. I love you, Lord. I love you. I praise you. I thank you. I bless you. And I thank you for your blessings and your love. I thank you for your revelation and your amazing word. I thank you for the changes you've made in me and in many people around me. And in my life. And for providing for me everything I need. And then some. We thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your gift and your precious blood that washes away sin. It is in your name, Lord, that we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the goal of your Christian life is clear as day and is contained within the word over and over and over again. Please make it your heart's desire. Please make it your New Year's goal your vow to the Lord that you will spend more time in his word because the only way you are going to get the real truth, his truth is from his word, not from me, not from anyone else that is on YouTube or anywhere else or in the pulpit. You're not going to get the truth from them. You're going to get it from the word because if they're spitting out truth, it's because they got it from the word. The only truth I know is his truth from his word. It's not mine. I don't want to give my truth because my truth is fallible. His truth is perfect. 
I'll, do, I'll be doing these prayer videos, at the very least prayer videos, until something happens to stop me. And it's going to take him or it's going to take the world to stop me. Because I'm going to find, find a way. And that's not, it's not because I get anything from this. And people have told, been spreading rumors around saying that I'm making money on the side or um, I'm doing this. I can't even see my subscriber count anymore. I turned all that off. I literally can't see. I can't see the likes and dislikes on the videos. I turned it off. You can't see it. I can't see it either. I would have to turn it back on in order to see it. Because that's not my driving force behind this. My driving force is because I love my God and because I love you. And I'm so disgusted with the lies being put, put out there and the way they mock him by the lies they tell. I wanted to give the truth. The actual truth. And not this fake made up truth that the world tries to shove down our throats. Read the word. Glorify your God in heaven. Be a blessing to your brethren and to the unbeliever. And wait for Christ because he's almost here. I love you guys very much. I thank you all for watching the videos. Please comment a prayer request. Email me a prayer request. The comments for morning prayers are going to be opened up now. So you can put your prayer request in the morning and I'll do it in the evening. Stay strong and stay faithful, guys. Stay in the Word and rest in Christ. You don't have to go looking for good things to do. He'll bring them to you. And the fruit you develop, if you're not developing fruit doing that, you're developing fruit by your faith, by loving Him and glorifying Him and giving thanks to Him. That's fruit. By growing in grace, by growing in sanctification. That's fruit. It's all in the, in the Scriptures. It's all in the Word. I love you guys very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I pray he does too. I'll see you guys in the next video.